Well, I'm so glad that you are here this morning. For those of you joining us right now online, my name is Eric, and I'm one of the pastors here, and we are finishing off our series this morning called Big, where we've talked about what it means to, to dream big, what it means to pray big, and today we're going to finish off by talking about what it means for us to believe big. And something that we've been saying every single week throughout this series, it actually came from the very first week, and that was this. He's a big God, and he's got big dreams for me. He's a big God, and he's got big dreams for me. And what I want you to do is I want you to turn to somebody next to you. If you're joining us online, I want you to type it into the chat. Talk about this in your neighborhood gathering. I want you to turn to somebody and encourage them and remind them of that. Say this, he's a big God, and he's got big dreams for me for you. Turn and talk to somebody about that just really quick. Well, two weeks ago, we talked about how important it is for us to not let today's, this was so good, not let today's problems overshadow tomorrow's possibilities. And last week, Pastor Brad talked about what it means for us to pray big. He said this, big dreams require bold declarations. And then he talked about how there might be things in your way, and he asked us these questions. What is in the way of your God-given dream, and what do you need God to move? What is in the way of your God-given dream, and what is it that you need God to move? I want you to take 30 seconds just right now. How would you answer that question to the person next to you? How would you answer that online in your neighborhood gathering? What is in the way of your God-given dream, and what do you need God to move? Take 30 seconds and answer that. Well, today we are bringing our series to a close by talking about what it looks like to believe big. We've dreamed big, we've prayed big, and now we're going to believe big. We're going to be in the book of Joshua, chapter 1. So if you have your Bibles, I want you to turn and go to the, the book of Joshua, chapter 1. Or if you have the Bible app on your phone, you can open that now and go to the, the book of Joshua, chapter 1. If you don't have a Bible, by the way, I would highly encourage you to download version think that'll be really helpful for you. And I read out of the New Living Translation. This is uh, right at a time in Joshua 1, right at a time when Moses, who was one of the greatest leaders that, that we've ever seen, one of the greatest prophets in the Old Testament, he is the one that led the people of Israel out of slavery in Egypt, led them through the wilderness, and led them right to the outskirts of the Promised Land, which was the land that God promised the people of Israel that they would inherit. And this is right when they're on the cusp of getting into the promised land. And then Moses, Moses dies. And God speaks to Joshua to tell him that now is the time for him to lead the people into the promised land. And here's what's interesting about that is earlier on, God told Joshua that this was what was going to happen, just not right now. God, Joshua was chosen to do this. He was anointed by God to lead the people of Israel. He was Moses' assistant, but now Moses has died, and God is telling them that now is the time for this to happen. He dreamed, he prayed, and now it's time for Joshua to believe big because he's about to lead the people of Israel into the promised land. If you look at Joshua chapter 1, we're going to read verse 1 through 9. It says this, After the death of Moses, the Lord's servant, the Lord spoke to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' assistant. He said, Moses... My servant is dead. Therefore, the time has come for you to lead these people, the Israelites, across the Jordan River into the land I'm giving them. I promise you what I promised Moses. Wherever you set your foot, you will be on land I've given you. From the Negev wilderness in the south to the Lebanon mountains in the north, from the Euphrates River in the east to the Mediterranean Sea in the west, including all the land of the Hittites. No one will be able to stand against you as long as you live, for I will be with you as I was with Moses. I will not fail you or abandon you. Be strong and courageous, for you are the one who will lead these people to possess all the land I swore to their ancestors I would give them. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey the instructions Moses gave you. 
Do not deviate from them, turning either to the right or to the left. Then you will be successful in everything that you do. Study this book of instruction continually. Meditate on it day and night so you will be sure to obey everything written in it. Only then will you prosper and succeed in all you do. This is my command. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Let's pray. God, we thank you again just for this time that we have to gather, to open your word, to worship. And we don't take it lightly. We don't take it for granted. And God, I pray right now as we just continue to look at this story and what it means for our life, that scripture will just come alive as we talk about it. And ask for your spirit to move among this place and, and meet each one of us right where we're at. And I want to say only what you want me to say, nothing more, nothing less. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, Dan. So before the events of Joshua 1, like I said earlier, Joshua was chosen and he was anointed by God to lead the people of Israel. He's given this dream and God tells him that it's going to happen. It's just not going to happen right now. So Joshua is dreaming big. Joshua is praying big. He's the assistant to Moses. And then later on, Moses dies. And now Joshua is thrusted into this leadership position. And all of a sudden, this dream that was a, a maybe someday going to happen kind of dream is now all of a sudden becoming a reality. And it's overwhelming. I mean, just imagine this. You're leading an entire group of people. You're leading an entire culture. You're leading the entire people of Israel into the land, which is already kind of a big deal, but this is the fulfillment of a promise that God made to the people of Israel years before, that now Joseph is having to assume this position of leadership and lead the people of Israel into the promised land. I mean, this is a lot of responsibility. This is really heavy stuff here. And maybe you can relate to that. You've got a dream. You're praying big. But the more and more that you get closer to your dream, the more and more that it becomes like it's going to be a reality, and the clearer that it becomes in your mind, maybe the more of an impossibility that it becomes. And you've got to believe big to keep moving. This is exactly where Joshua is. And I can relate to that. Let me tell you what happened. I graduated college in 2007, and I had a dream for my life to do ministry. I wanted to be used by God, I wanted to serve the church, and I wanted my life to be about building God's kingdom. And I remember saying this when I was graduating college and I knew what was, what, where we were gonna go and what was gonna happen and kind of what my next step looked like. I remember saying this, God, I am ready whenever wherever. Like, let's do this. I'm ready to be used by you. And if I could caution you just a little bit, when you pray that kind of prayer, God's going to answer it, right? When you say whenever, when you say wherever, I'm ready to be used by you, God goes, all right. So whenever, wherever, right? Okay, let's do this. I'll do this. Here we go. So I graduated on co from college on a Saturday. Six days later, I get married. And uh, <laughs> thank you, Siv. <laughs> it's my wife. If you're, you can't see her online, but she is here, I promise. And six days later, got married. And three weeks after that, my wife and I moved to Canada. And we worked at a church up there for eight years. So when I said whenever, when I said wherever, God said Canada. Now, if you're... If you're wondering about Canada, like where's the connection and how in the world did you end so far north when you grew up in Oklahoma City? It's a great question. The long story short is that the connection to Canada started with my mom. So when my mom was a kid, her youth pastor was named Joe. Joe's best friend was named Bill. And Bill was the pastor of this church in Canada. And my mom spent time in Canada in the winter, sometimes in the summer. She would go up and she would spend time with Bill and his wife, Barb. And then when I came along, Bill and Barb would come down to Oklahoma City and they would stay with my family and I for a night or two or sometimes just for the evening and hanging out, telling stories, singing songs. So I just kind of grew up expecting in the fall to see Bill and Barb. And they never called. They never wrote. 
It'd be 9, 30, 10 o'clock at night, and you'd hear this, hey, it's Bill. Like, you wouldn't even knock. And, and, and then Barb would be like, oh, Bill, just knock. Oh, they know it's us. <laughs> every, every October, we just assumed that they were going to show up. And I remember it was my senior year, and they came in the fall, and they asked me what I was doing for the summer. And I said, well, I don't really have any plans. Well, you should come up to Canada. So I went up to Canada the summer after I graduated high school. It was kind of like an intern at the church. And I did that every single summer in college. I would go up, and I was an intern at the church. I would help out with the summer camp. And that was kind of what my life looked like. And during that time, I was able to see what life looked like in ministry. I was able to shadow Bill and see how he led the church. I was able to see how he did ministry, and I was able to just see how he did life. I did that every single summer in college, and in the spring of my senior year is when Bill calls us about a job. So like I said, got married, moved up to Canada, and I kid you not when I say this, our U-Haul pulled up in front of the house. We unloaded it. We had boxes everywhere in the house. Do you remember this? Like we had boxes everywhere, almost to the ceiling, and Bill goes, okay, we got to go to camp. And I was like, well, you don't understand here. I mean, there's, there's this house we got to unpack. He goes, okay, well, we're going to have dinner tonight, and then we leave tomorrow. It's going to be great. And we had dinner that night, and we left for camp, and we, were, we ran summer camps for three weeks in a row. I mean, we just hit the ground running. And we were rocking and we were rolling and I was working with the students and leading worship every now and then. Sib was leading the children's ministry. We were just, we were doing what we felt like God had called us to do. And a little over two years later is when Bill died. Bill, the leader, the pastor, my friend, he dies. And myself and my wife and the, and the church, we were like, wow, well, what's going to happen? What's What's the next step? And I remember thinking, I feel really sorry for the person that they get to fill that post. That was my initial thought. And slowly but surely, <laughs> the church looked to my wife and I to leave. And all of a sudden, we were thrusted into this leadership position. And I remember feeling overwhelmed. I remember thinking, look, here, I I'm not even trained for this. Like, this isn't even my skill set. And before I knew it, I was doing things that I really didn't even know what I was doing. I remember going to a zoning committee meeting because they talked about the property that the church owned and wondering what they were going to do with the part across the street, and they asked my opinion. I was like, I don't care. I, I don't know anything about zoning or land or any of that stuff. And I'm just sitting there like, why would anybody do this? Is what I remember thinking. And slowly but surely, it became more of a reality that this is what we were called to do. And I had to believe big in that moment because what God had called me to, my dream for ministry, this is my next step. And this is what he was calling me to do. So in that moment, I had to believe big. And I didn't have Bill to go to coffee with to help me figure things out. It was just kind of moment by moment, day by day, conversation by conversation. I had to believe big, and it required big faith for me to step into that role. And I want you to write this down. Believing big requires big faith. Believing big requires big faith. This is where Joshua is finding himself. Again, he's taken over for one of the greatest leaders that the world has ever seen. God gave Joshua this dream, telling him, hey, this is what is going to happen. And now it's happening. God is calling him to do this. He's calling him to step out. He's calling him to act. He's calling him to step into this position. And I've got some questions for you. What is God calling you to do? What is God asking you to do? When it comes to your dream, what is God calling you to do? What is God asking you to do? What dream has God given you? Because you have a dream. You might be sitting there and you might think, I, I don't know what my dream is. I don't know if I know how to dream anymore. God has given you a dream. Dream big. Pray big. 
And now it's time to believe big, and that requires big faith. Why? Because you're going to have moments when you doubt. You're going to have moments when you wonder, can I do this? Like, do do I have what it takes? You're going to have those moments when you're not going to know how something is going to go. It's going to feel like it's just all up in the air, like it's all just a roll of the dice. You're going to have those moments. And if you haven't had them yet, when it comes to your dream, you will. So what do we do in those moments that are coming where we doubt, where we feel unsure, where we're not really certain about what to do next? How do we have the big faith that we need in those moments to believe big? Because without big faith, we won't really be believing big. So how do we do that? Because that's what God wants all of us to do when it comes to our dream is to believe big. Let's look back at the story. Joshua 1, verse 5 and 6. No one will be able to stand against you as long as you live. For I will be with you as I was with Moses. I will not fail you or abandon you. Be strong and courageous. For you are the one who will lead these people to possess all the land I swore to their ancestors I would give them. What God is doing in this moment, he's reminding Joshua of how he was with Moses. He's reminding Joshua of how he was with Moses and how he will be with him. He tells Joshua that he will not fail him. He promises Joshua that he will not abandon him, is what he says. He's reminding Joshua of his might. He's reminding Joshua of his power. He's reminding Joshua of all the things that he's experienced up to this point when it comes to the way that God helped Moses lead the people of Israel. God is reminding Joshua of his power, of his presence, and the way that it was revealed in a cloud, the way that it was revealed in fire, the way that God provided provision and food and things that the people of Israel needed when they're roaming the desert. God is reminding Joshua in this moment that anything is possible. Have you ever felt that way? Like anything is possible? The sky is the limit? I remember a poster that hung in the back of my choir teacher's classroom in high school, and it said, shoot for the moon. Even if you miss, you'll land among the stars. Which, now that I understand astronomy, you won't land among the stars because they're still millions of light years away. But the concept of it is very nice, right? Dream big, right? The sky is the limit. Look at Joshua 1.3. God says to Joshua, I promise you what I promised Moses. Wherever you set your foot, you will be on land I've given you. Wherever you set your foot. What does that mean? That means take a step. God is instructing Joshua to act, to move, to take a step. And God is telling Joshua that if you will believe big and if you will step and if you will take a step and act, that I'm going to give you everything you need. But you got to step out. If you act, it's going to happen. Anything is possible. That's what God is reminding Joshua of here in this moment. So again, when was the last time you felt that way? Like anything is possible. Maybe you have felt that way. Maybe you haven't, or maybe you've just forgotten. Either way, think back to when you were a kid, because when we were kids, we wake up and anything is possible, and I see this, I see this in my kids. The other weekend, Noah, my oldest, he came to me and was like, Dad, I'm bored. That's not how he sounds, but that's just my voice for boys. (laughs) And I said, no, you're not, which that's just a classic dad trick. Dads, if you haven't done this, especially when you're on a road trip, I mean, it just works great. Dad, I got to go to the bathroom. You're four hours into the trip. No, you don't. Just like that, magic, they don't. Okay, that's not really how it works. But it is a classic dad thing to say, right? Dad, I'm bored. No, you're not. Go outside. Oh, I don't know what to do. Noah, it's outside. Anything is possible. You know what he said? Mm-hmm. And he walks outside. 
He kind of stormed outside, but he kind of walked outside. But that's just those, you know, those good old preteen hormones. I love it. So he goes outside. Some time goes by. And then he comes back inside. And not for very long because he gets Isaac and he gets Zeke. And the three of them go back outside. And I was curious for a second. I thought, well, I wonder what they're doing. No, no, I'll just kind of give them some time. And some more time goes by. And we started to hear laughter. And we started to hear the sound of fun. And here's, here's what they did. They found some rope, and they found uh, pieces of our fence post that we didn't need anymore. And they tied the rope to the fence post, and they threw it around the biggest tree limb of a, uh, in, our, in our backyard of our tree that hangs over the, uh, the trampoline. And they made a swing that swung out over the trampoline. And watching them, they were giggling, they were cackling. And, and as far as they were, they were concerned, that was the best day of their lives because they were outside, anything was possible. I mean, they were living the dream. We didn't have to buy a swing. They've always wanted a swing set. We didn't have to buy one. They just looked at what they had, and they made it. Anything is possible. They were living the dream. And what I take away from that is how important it is for us to remember that anything is possible. With God, anything is possible. Even Jesus, the Son of God, reminds his disciples in one of the earlier Gospels in the New Testament. He says, with God, anything is possible. Everything is possible. All things are possible. Whichever translation that you read that from, anything is possible with God. And what we've got to remember is that it's possible. Our dream, it's going to happen. But we've got to step out. We've got to act. We've got to take that step. And this is what it looks like to believe big. And I want you to write this down. Believing big requires taking a step. Believing big requires taking a step. You've got to take a step. You've got to act. You've got to move. Otherwise, you're just going to find yourself bored. And it's not just kids that get bored. We can get bored. We can get bored with our kids. We can get bored with our family. We can get bored with school. We can get bored with our career. We can find ourselves just bored with life. I mean, if we're really being honest. And, and maybe you're sitting there and you're like, whoa, I wouldn't say that I'm bored of my kids or my marriage or my family or my career or my, or my life. I mean, that's, that's maybe kind of pushing the envelope. Well, here's how you know if you are. Here's how you know if you're bored. You find yourself saying that you're just tired all the time. You're nothing but busy. You've got no energy. You don't want to give anything to your family. Like when there's an opportunity to participate, you just don't want to exert any kind of energy to act or to get involved. You want to just get by with the absolute bare minimum when it comes to your job. And maybe, maybe the worst part of your day is when you're driving to work because you just absolutely dread it. Or maybe you go to school and you're completely uninspired. You're just not challenged. And so you're just kind of checking the days until the weekend. Or you're counting down the days until graduation. How do you know if you're bored with your marriage? You don't really talk anymore. You don't want to talk at all. You don't prioritize time together. It's just, it's just not a priority anymore. It used to be early on. But now you're just kind of you're just kind of bored. And parents, here's how you know if you're bored and disengaged with your kids, you're doing the yeah, yeah, what? You don't know what that means. Your kid's talking to you, and you're disengaged. And so you're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And your kid's like, what? Really? Like we can go there? Like I can buy that? And you go, wait, what? You're just not tracking, right? Like you're just completely disengaged. And maybe at one point, maybe your dream was to have kids, was to have a family, and to create this culture of fun, of love, and adventure. And you just kind of drifted and stopped prioritizing that. You're bored. Here's what boredom does. Boredom comes from a lack of belief, which leads to a lack of action. Boredom comes from a lack of belief, which leads to a lack of action. We just get stuck, right? Like we just settle. 
And we just kind of coast. We just kind of survive. We just kind of drift. And maybe you're bored because you forgot what your dream was. Or maybe you think that it's not possible. And there's two sides to thinking that it's, your dream isn't possible. One is because you might think that you're too young. And the other, you might think it's because that you're too old. You think that you don't have the time. You don't have the resources. You don't have the creativity. You have no way of making your dream happen. And this is where God steps in, like any good dad would do. I love watching parents with their kids when they're engaged, when they're pressing in. And what do parents usually do in those moments? That's what God does when he reminds us of what we've been created to do and how we've been created to live, right? He bends down on his knees and he looks us in the eye and he says, you got to go outside. Like, just go play. Trust me. It's going to happen. You just got to move. You just got to act. Go outside and play. That's what God is reminding us to do in these moments is to believe big. Believing big means believing that God gave me this dream. And if God gave me this dream, then he's going to help me make it happen. And I'm going to step out. And I'm going to trust that he's going to provide the resources, that he's going to provide the time, that he's going to provide the creativity that I need. That's what believing big looks like. And that's what it was with my kids. They had to trust me to go outside. And I just imagined them walking outside and they said, I'm going to act. I'm going to move. And I'm going to trust God to bring the rope and the wood. And I doubt they said any of those things. Like just to be completely honest with you, you probably, boys, did you say this? Yeah, no, you didn't say any of those things. But they could have. But they went outside. They took that step. Believing big requires taking a step. So when it comes to you and when it comes to your dream, what is a step that you need to take? That could be a big step. That could be a small step. Maybe it's a step that you know that you have been needing to take for quite a long time. And I'm, I'm here to encourage you to take that step. But what is that? I want you to take 30 seconds right now to think about what step you need to take when it comes to your dream. For those of you joining us online, write in the chat what your next step is. Talk about this at your neighborhood gathering. Take 30 seconds. What is your next step when it comes to your dream? back at the story, Joshua 1.9. This is what God says to Joshua. This is my command. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. God reminds Joshua three times in this story, three times, to be strong and courageous. One time he says, be strong and very courageous. Just a little extra oomph kind of in there. Three times he reminds him to be strong and courageous and that he's with him wherever he goes. But not only that, here's what's so cool. God tells Joshua to bring the people together, to tell them what they need to know, to tell them what they need to remember, and to tell them what's coming. So Joshua calls the people together. And everything that God tells Joshua, Joshua tells the people. They're ready, and they receive, but then the people respond. The people respond to Joshua after he's given them God's instructions. And listen how the people respond to Joshua. This is so cool. This is in Joshua 1.18. This, this is the people speaking to Joshua. Anyone who rebels against your orders and does not obey your words and everything you command will be put to death. So be strong and courageous. The people confirm God's dream to Joshua by saying the same thing that God said to him. 
be strong and courageous. Which is really interesting for Joshua to be told this because he's a soldier, he's a warrior, and God is reminding him three times to be strong and courageous when this just, just seemed natural to him, right? But this is an unprecedented event that Joshua is now in charge of. And it's not just God reminding him, it's the people that are reminding him, be strong and courageous. That's their way of saying, we believe in you, God has called you to this, you've got what it takes. So long before we went to Canada, I remember standing in my graduation ceremony for college. And the graduation ceremony is over, and the tradition is at SNU for the graduating class to walk the campus, and then we gather around the fountain that's in the center of the campus there. And there's this fake string of, of ivy. It's fake. It's plastic. But it goes around the entire fountain. And every graduating senior comes, and they grab a piece of it. And this was the piece of ivy that I was grabbing. And there's, there's closing remarks, and there's some nice things that were said. There's a prayer and all that. I honestly don't remember anything uh, of that. I don't remember what anybody said. I don't remember what anybody prayed during that kind of benediction time. I remember standing there holding this ivy, and I'm like, oh, okay, this is it. And I remember feeling excited, and I'm pumped up. I mean, we're about to graduate, and we're about to take on the world is how I felt. And then, whoosh, I felt so small. And I'm surrounded by hundreds of people, but I felt so alone. And I remember thinking, oh, my goodness. Do I have what it takes for what's next? Do I have what it takes to do this? And I remember standing there just feeling paralyzed by that fear because I was believing big. I was stepping out, and I was about to act, but then I pulled back for a second, and I thought, do I have what it takes to do this? So the ivy is broken, and I'm standing there and holding it and kind of going, okay, we did it. Ooh. Okay, do I have what it takes? Do I have what it takes? Do I have what it takes? Kind of like Dwayne Johnson's character in one of the Jumanji movies when he's like, don't cry, don't cry, don't cry, don't cry, don't cry, don't cry. Don't cry. That was kind of me. That was, my, that was my moment of like panic and freaking out. Do I have what it takes? Do I have what it takes? Do I have what it takes? And one of my professors, one of my tougher professors, comes up to me, and he, he tells me something that I'll never forget. He told me how proud he was of me for my graduation. And he told me that I had what it takes to do ministry. And he told me that wherever I went, that God was going to be with me. And I think of that every single time I look at this ivy, which hangs in my office. This is a reminder to me that I have what it takes, that God is going to be with me. God is giving you a dream. And God is going to confirm it through other people. Here's the last thing I want you to write down. Believing big requires other people. Believing big requires other people. This is why we've been pushing so hard for everybody to be in a core group in September. Because when you're second guessing yourself, not if, but when you're second guessing yourself, when you're wondering, do I have what it takes to do this? Am I too young? Am I too old? Can I even make this happen? Do I have the creativity? Do I have the resources? Do I have the time? There are going to be those moments when you're unsure. And it can be that one person in your core group that says, I believe in you. God is with you. You can do this. But not only that, you can be that person for somebody in your core group. You can stand alongside them when maybe nobody else is. And you can remind them, you can speak that life into them that you can do this, that God is with you, that I believe in you, that you have what it takes. You can encourage them to dream big. You can encourage them to pray big. And you can encourage them to believe big. And you can encourage them to not settle, to not get stuck to not get bored, and you can encourage them to go outside and play. Believing big requires big faith. Believing big requires taking a step. And believing big requires other people, and we get to be those people. We get to be those people. He is a big God, and he's got big dreams for you.